Hey guys, it's MJ, the student actuary, and in this video, we're going to be looking at immunization. So this is part two of chapter 14 for course CT1. Now, immunization, it's a bit weird. It's kind of confusing the first time you look at it, and at first glance, it doesn't make much sense at all. But what you're going to find is that it is very mathematical, and it actually is very easy if you draw your timelines. So what we're going to do is, before we get into all the mathematics, you're going to see we're going to be looking at stuff like convexity, which has got the double derivative. We're going to be looking at volatility and duration mean term and all these weird and wonderful things. Before we dive into that, let's just take a step back. So what I've got here, it's a program called Affinity Designer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the beginning. I'm going to go back to the beginning of the course because it's important that we understand the basics so that we understand immunization. And the basics of the course is, it's very simple. It's if we have a cash flow, um, so the length of this represents the magnitude, so this could be like, say, $100. If we have a cash flow um, in the future, so you can see this is time zero and this is time future. If we have a cash flow in the future, how much is it worth in the beginning? And what we've learned throughout this course is that we take this amount and it becomes a little bit smaller. And this amount here is equal to that amount there. So this amount, these two amounts are exactly the same um, when you take the time value of money into consideration. The difference between them, so if I had to draw, let's say, with a different color, Oh no, I want to keep that color there, but I want to make a little value there. This red part here is what the interest component is. And what makes the subject interesting, excuse the pun, is that we could have this situation or we could have a situation like this. So these two um, colorful blocks here, either one of them could be that value at time zero, where red represents the interest that will be earned and blue represents the present value. The amount of this red value depends on what the interest rate is. Now, how people actually get to the interest rate, that is a very philosophical uh, discussion. And in my opinion, it's kind of just made up by the central government, depending on what economic uh, motives they want to chase. So that's why this value here, this red value, can change. And that's what immunization seeks to protect your portfolio against. Immunization um, was developed by an actuary called Reddington, a British actuary, and he noticed that asset portfolios were sensitive to changes in interest rates. Because if you have a payment you know, in the future and the interest rate is very high, then that amount that you need in the beginning is very low. But if interest rates are low, then you're going to need a much bigger value here. And vice versa. The amount of money you invest now, depending on the interest rate, will affect the amount of money you actually receive at the end. So in order to combat this interest rate sensitivity that is in your portfolio, Reddington devised three rules that should be implemented to protect your portfolio against these changes. And you want to do this because the fact that interest rates can just change can mean your company or your business or even yourself could lose lots of money. So it's a good idea to immunize um, your portfolio. So with the basics done and understanding that uh, money has a time value, money's worth more, uh, worth more in the present than it is in the future because of interest, Let's dive back into the mathematics. So let's come back to, to my mathematics. And before we get into the, the, you know, the nitty gritty of it, let's look at what are the three conditions that Reddington wants for immunization. He says that the present value of the assets must equal the present value of the liabilities. Now straight away, when you think about it, you could actually relax this so that the present value of the assets should be greater than or equal to the present value of the liabilities. But present value of assets equal present value of liabilities 
it's a fair statement to make as you you want to chase the, the cheapest way to immunize um, your portfolio. Because if your present value of your assets was much, much bigger than your present value of liabilities, you wouldn't really have to worry. But let's say your assets and your liabilities are the same. What you want is the volatility of your assets and your liabilities to be the same, and you want the convexity of your assets to be greater than the convexity of your liabilities. Now, these are the three conditions you need to hold so that you can be protected against changes in the interest rate. Now, this isn't perfect. I mean, straight away we can see there are five big problems with Reddington's um, theory. It requires constant rebalancing of your asset portfolio, so that's going to be expensive. Um, sometimes cash flows are uncertain, so it's really difficult to do the maths. Um, the assets that we're going to see that we might need may not even exist. And it only really gives you protection against a small chunk of interest rate change. And it assumes that the, the yield curve is flat. And we saw in the previous video that that isn't the case. So straight away, we know that this isn't a perfect system. But it is very elegant. And we're going to go look into the mathematics and how you can do these exam questions. Um, I will end off with an example, uh, just so that we, we all end on the same page. But first of all, present value of assets equal present value of liabilities. You've been doing that the whole course, so I'm not going to go into that. That is like the equation of value. That was chapter 12, chapter 13, all of those ones. What we're going to do now is just look at the mathematics behind point 2 and point 3, because it is a little bit tricky the first time you come around it. So... First thing we look at is discounted mean term, or otherwise known as DMT. Although I don't recommend that you Google DMT because you will find a psychedelic drug and not this mathematical concept. So don't Google DMT. Google discounted mean term if you want more information on it. Okay, and what it is basically saying, it is the average time of the cash flows weighted by their present value. So if I was to just show that uh, graphically, Let's just get rid of these things over here. If I had um, just one cash flow, and let's say this at time 5, then the discounted mean term would be 5. But if I had one at 5 and one at um, 7 years, then the discounted mean term would be 6 years. You know, 5, 7, middle, 6. But where this gets a little bit more sophisticated is it takes in the weight of the cash flow. So... If this cash flow here was double the amount, so at time 7, it's double the amount of time 5, then the discounted mean term would be more like 6.5 or 6.75 or something like that. It would lean more towards the heavily weighted cash flows. Now, this is all easy in this case, but what you're going to see with bonds is you have this. You know, let me actually draw the, the normal cash flow pattern of a bond, and you'll see why you actually have to use mathematics to figure this thing out. Just bear with me as I copy and paste. Okay, so this is how a normal bond looks. You have your coupons and then you have your redemption amount. So your discounted mean term needs to factor in that the redemption amount is normally much heavier. Or well, if I actually draw it to scale, it would be something like that. Um, so you can see the discounted mean term would lie somewhere somewhere over there. But you don't have to guess. Um, that's why you use mathematics so that you don't have to guess. So let's go back to the mathematics. So what you're doing is you're taking the cash uh, flow value, you're discounting it, uh, multiplying it by its time, and then you're just dividing it to get that weight. And this gives you the DMT. I think that symbol is called tau. And it is connected to volatility by the following formula. Uh, I'm not going to go too heavy into the mathematics on why it gets that, but please feel free and actually do think about why that formula makes sense. It'll be a good example for you. Um, then, I mean, there is a quick example. You can pause and just read through it. The tricky part here is that coupons are paid half yearly, so your DMT will give you a value in half years. And so the final step you need to do is just convert to 4.1. Um, what you will notice by looking at the maths here is that by taking, um, by multiplying here the, the, the time by the cash flow, and because time is increasing, you know, you've got time one, time two, time three, time four, 
you are going to be getting an increasing annuity uh, function to deal with. And I know, or well, I remember, I used to struggle a little bit with this because it is a little bit harder to handle mathematically, but do a lot of practice and it will become easy. And so that's how you can get the DMT. The vol volatility modified duration, it's just a little bit more sophisticated and um, you can also calculate it another way. So you can calculate it either using the DMT and then using this formula here, uh, dividing by the interest, or you can just take the present value, um, take the derivative of it, divide by the present value, and you'll know, you'll start seeing that this is very similar to calculus, you're introducing derivatives, you're looking at different curves and all this type of stuff. And what the, the idea of immunization is, or what we're going to see um, happens is you want to balance your your cash flows with another type of cash flow. Um, so you'll have your asset cash flow and your liability cash flow, and immunization lets you balance them or gives you that protection against interest rate. And I'll show you guys that um, on the timeline a little bit later on. But feel free to pause, um, go through this example. I don't want to go through it because otherwise this video will be too long, and I think you guys can all read. Um, I'll do the final the final uh, example altogether. Finally, there is this thing known as convexity. Um, it measures the spread of the payments. So the more spread out your cash flow is, the higher the convexity. And I mean, this if you think about it logically, um, let's actually just draw it on a little timeline. Let's say um, this is my cash flow over here. The blue cash flow, and then let's make another one. What color should we make it? Orange. Um, if we have these two cash flows, okay, so let's pretend they're two different assets. The orange one has got a lower convexity to the blue ones, okay, because the blue ones are much more spread out than the orange one. The orange one is just situated on one point, which means that the orange one is much more sensitive to interest rate changes than the blue ones. Because if we change the interest rate with the blue ones, this guy will be affected a lot, but these guys not so much, because remember, interest rate has that type of curve. Um, it's like an exponential um, curve. So this won't be affected that much by change in interest rate. This will be a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. This one will be a, a little bit more, like, but this guy will be affected much uh, greater. And because he's also being affected, he gets counterbalanced by this one, so that's where convexity comes in. I hope I explained that well. Um, You'll see, the first time you're looking at immunization, it is weird. It is, it is weird, it is a little bit spacey and stuff like that. But the more examples you do, you'll finally click and it'll, it'll all make sense. It is an easy part of the course um, in the sense that you just need to be strong mathematically. Um, you know, you just have to take, know how to take second derivatives and stuff like that. So yeah, that's what the convexity does. Again, this is more calculus. So when people are like, oh, how does calculus help me in, later on in life? or well, if you want to become an actuary, you need to know it. Um, so yeah, convexity is the second derivative, volatility we saw was the very first derivative. So now that we have the basics of immunization under our belt, we understand that there are the limits, and learn these five points. I mean, in the exam, they will maybe ask you this, and you can get two easy marks by just you know remembering these five uh, points. But I would encourage you guys also just to think about the points. Think about why may an asset not exist. That's a nice thing to think about. Um, you know, some assets just don't exist because the market is not sophisticated at the moment. However, in the future, those assets may exist. I mean, it's nice to think about and you can really get lost in the thought. But anyway, let's get to a typical immunization um, exam type question. This one is quite easy. Um, what it's saying is that you have liabilities of 20,000 Rand due in 15 years time. So in 20, in 15 years time, you owe 20,000 Rand, okay? Now you need to set up your assets in such a way that you are immunized or protected against changes in interest rate. Because remember, if interest rates were to come down, so if we had low interest rates, it would mean that this liability is very expensive to us. If interest rates are very high, then this liability is very cheap to us. And if you're not understanding that, pause the video, just think of that statement I've just said through, and then click resume and we'll continue. But it's important to understand that, but like I said, that's 
the past past 13 chapters have been dealing with that idea. Um, so let's go back to our question. We owe 20,000 uh, Rand in 15 years time. Okay, and we're going to immunize it with two zero coupon bonds, bond X and bond Y. Now bond X is going to be 10,000 Rand and um, at time 10 and now we need to figure out what um, what is the term needed for bond Y. So when when do we need to invest or what type of asset should we purchase in order to immunize this position? And <coughs> sorry, I've still got a bit of a cough. Straight away, um, do you think Y is going to be greater than 15, less than 15? What do you think? Okay, it's good to make these, these little guesses early on so that you can see um, if your answer at the end of the day if it's reasonable or not. So, back to the example, we've got a 20,000 rand bond due in 15 uh, years time. We have a bond where people are going to pay us 10,000 back in 10 years time. We can now set up another bond and we need to determine the term in order to give us immunization. So, what we can do straight away is we can figure out what is the present value of the assets equals the present value of the liabilities. And we set up our equation of values. Our assets are 10,000 discounted by 10, um, 10 years, plus this value of Y. Um, and this must be equal to the bond discounted by 15 years. So we know that the value of Y is going to be at time zero is going to be equal to 2,165 bucks. But remember, this is the value of Y at time zero. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the discounted mean term of our assets and we're going to make them equal to our liabilities. And what we do is we use that formula where we time the term by um, the cash flow amount and we're going to see that 10x, because 10 is the duration of the first bond, plus ny, because n is the value, it's the unknown that we're going to try to solve for, and we're going to need to make it equal um, we're going to need to solve for n in this equation. And we know that when you add these values together, we're going to get something like this. And we see that n is equal to 26,7 years. So like we see, we made the guess here. We had to put the value here, which you should have, you should have realized because remember, we want the discounted uh, mean term to be balanced. If this was a little bit shorter, we'd have to balance it by putting a value here. It's like a little bit like a seesaw or some scales. So uh, hopefully you guys did realize that you had to put the value later. We see that N is bigger than 15, so it makes reasonable sense. And now straight away, we can see that the spread of the assets is greater than the spread of the liabilities in the sense that liabilities is a single amount and our assets are two amounts, which means, remember my blue and orange cash flows, it has the greater convexity. So you can actually just say that. In the exam, you can get away, if, if you use general reasoning like I've just done there, you can say the spread of the assets is greater than the, the spread of the liabilities and therefore its convexity is greater. And then you can conclude by saying immunization is achieved. So you didn't actually even have to go out and do that second calculation. But that is because this was a very simple example. So let's actually just end off this video by drawing this um, thing here on our timeline. So let's just delete all of these here. So yeah, we have the 20,000 Rand bond over there. And what I'm going to do is, yeah, let me just raise it up here. So we've got this 20,000 Rand uh, bond there. And by setting up our one bond over here, I should actually set, put these ones on the top and the orange one up below because those are our assets and those are our liabilities. You can see, I think this one's even like a little bit smaller and it's going in the future there. So this is what it looks like graphically and if this was like say a seesaw scale, um, immunization kind of shows that the portfolio has been balanced and when it is balanced, it is less sensitive to a change in interest rates. And that, yeah, that kind of is um, immunization. 
And that ends off uh, chapter 14 of course CT1 um, Actuarial Science. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you do have any questions, please let me know in the comment section. I will do my best to, to answer or explain any point that I maybe went uh, about too quickly. And if someone does ask a question and you know the answer, please feel free to, to help them out and yeah, to reply to that comment. But yeah, we've got um, one more video to do for CT1 and then the course is done. I know the exam is very, very soon, so I am going to get on to making that video uh, straight away. But yeah, thanks for watching guys. Cheers.